Hi everyone. Today's blog post is dedicated to cardiologists, cardiovascular surgeons, but in particular to all of you who are into emergency medicine, and to our friends from Life in the Fast Lane, a terrific site, entertaining and instructive at the same time. Don't forget to see the site. But now I want to invite you to watch the following case. A case which will show you how echocardiography can solve a medical mystery. Crime, suspect, echocardiography, CSE Vienna. It all began on the 29th of October 1981 in Mistelbach in the province of Lower Austria, a town which is located only 55 kilometers north of the capital of Austria in Vienna. Breaking news at that day. Tragic end of a game between two boys with a weapon pass free pistol in Mistelbach, Lower Austria. 16 year old auto mechanic HP played with the weapon together with a 13 year old friend JA. While loading the pistol, he inadvertently fired a shot into the chest of his friend. JA was immediately brought to the hospital in Mistelbach where he was operated. J.A. suffered a heart injury and is in a life-threatening condition. A dramatic rescue operation unfolds. J.A. is admitted to the hospital in shock because of pericardial tamponade, and the surgeons, without the possibility of a heart-lung machine, perform pericardial drainage and suture of the defect. Here is the surgeon as he shows the journalists exactly where the bullet hit the heart. And J.A. survives. J.A. leaves the hospital only 14 days later. Here you can see him with those who saved his life and with the friend who shot the bullet. Looking at the grim smile on the friend's face, one must have doubts if the shot was really fired inadvertently. But J.A. becomes an auto mechanic and is asymptomatic for many, many years. But 25 years later, at the age of 38, he presents with dyspnea, and an ECG showing left bundle branch block. Here is the echocardiogram, the four chamber view, and you will immediately recognize that the left ventricle is significantly dilated and that the function is significantly reduced. Also note that there's some degree of dyssynchrony caused by the left bundle branch block. But what is the reason for left ventricular dysfunction? Does he have dilated cardiomyopathy or does he have coronary artery disease? at the age of only 38. Looking at the regional wall motion, one does have the impression that the inferior region here, and also here in the two-chamber view, shows less contractility. We also have the impression that the basal inferior septum has a problem. But in the coronary angiogram, we find completely normal coronary arteries. But maybe color Doppler can help us solve the mystery. Indeed, we do see aortic regurgitation. But is aortic regurgitation significant? Is that the reason for left ventricular dysfunction? Looking at the pressure halftime, we find a pressure halftime of 650 milliseconds, which means aortic regurgitation is probably not significant and does not really explain the left ventricular dysfunction. So even though aortic regurgitation might contribute to left ventricular dysfunction, it's probably not the cause. Or do we have another problem altogether? Looking at the basal inferior septum here, we see that something seems to be going on here. And if we use color Doppler, we actually do see a small jet here from the left ventricle into the right ventricle. So is a VSD the problem here? Well, basically, a ventricular septal defect can cause left ventricular dysfunction. But then again, the jet does not appear to be that significant. But then, all of a sudden, we see a third and a fourth jet. This here is mitral regurgitation. But what is this here? Well, to clarify that, we need transesophageal echocardiography. And here is the TE study of this patient. Again, we see left ventricular dysfunction. And if we take a look at the short axis view at the level of the aortic valve, we see a small little cavity here. 
right in the neighborhood to the A coronary cusp. Looking more closely, we can see that there's actually two little chambers here, one here and one here. Is there communication to the aortic valve, to the aorta? Well, again, looking at the 2D image, we can see that there's a small little gap right here. And with color Doppler, we see that there is a communication also to the left atrium. Two large jets which show a systolic and diastolic flow. This view shows the problem in more detail. We seem to have a communication between the aorta, the chamber, and the left atrium via two large jets. This here is the continuous wave Doppler spectrum through the jets. And what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that we have systolic and diastolic flow. In other words, the communication has to be between the aorta and the left atrium. Because if the communication were between the LVOT, in other words, the left ventricle and the left atrium, we would only have a systolic jet, simply because diastolic pressure is higher in the left atrium than in the left ventricle during diastole. Therefore, there should not be any flow during diastole. In contrast, if the shunt, as in this case, is between the aorta and the left atrium, we have systolic-diastolic flow because the pressure in the aorta is always higher during diastole than that of the left atrium. Now let's turn to the interventricular septum, to the basal portion, to the region right down here. What is going on here? Is it disrupted? Yes, it is. We can see a jet pass right through the interventricular septum. That is the ventricular septal defect we saw earlier. And now to the aortic valve. What we see is we see a jet which passes right through the cusp. In other words, it seems as if there is a hole in the aortic valve. Well, let's solve the case. What do we have? We have a perforation of the right ventricular wall that was surgically closed. We have a ventricular septal defect. We have perforation of the aortic valve. And we also have a shunt between the aortic root and the left atrium. Something must have left its footprint. I guess you all realize by now, it must have been the bullet. Let's now turn to the ballistic investigation. Here on the left is a still image of the transesophageal echo of our patient, which shows you the path of the bullet. It entered the right ventricle right here, passed through the right ventricle, hit the aortic valve, causing perforation of the aortic valve, disruption of the aortic root, and then finally it entered the left atrium. And here is the corresponding four-chamber transthoracic view. Again, the path of the bullet right ventricle, intraventricular septum causing a VSD, through the aortic valve, through the aorta, and into the left atrium. The mitral regurgitant jet we see here is probably secondary, caused by dilatation of the left ventricle. And here you can see the path of the bullet on a diagram. Through the right ventricle, through the aortic valve, through the left atrium. Here is front, here is back, and again, the path of the bullet. But why is left ventricular function reduced? Well, very simple, because we have a shunt between the aorta and the left atrium. Therefore, we have blood flow, which again transverses the left ventricle. In other words, we have volume overload of the left ventricle. That, in addition to the volume overload caused by aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation, eventually led to left ventricle dysfunction many years after the initial lesion. But where is the bullet? Well, right here. The defect in the left atrium must have spontaneously sealed. So, ECHO has done it again. It has solved the case. And as an addendum, the patient was successfully reoperated and all the findings that we saw with the help of echocardiography were basically confirmed during surgery. Unfortunately, left ventricular function still remains reduced. So I hope you were able to see how we can put the puzzle together with echocardiography. One final word, there are no kangaroos in Austria.